Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I welcome you on this Thursday, not only to Mountain Cloud, but from Mountain Cloud. <laughs> My partner Scott and I've been staying here, sitting and Zooming and now quarantining ahead of Rohatsu, the Rohatsu retreat that begins next week. Gathering into the lengthening dark of December. Gathering in toward the dedicated quiet of retreat. So we'll be part of a small pod or skeleton crew sitting together in Mountain Cloud's uh, luminous earthen zendo. I'm tonight coming to you from the Doksan room because of the, the lighting in the zendo is for daytime only. So, uh, you know, we'll be here a hub really of this wheel of the Zendo without walls. We feel it so palpably, this one sitting of the worldwide Sangha. Not just Rohatsu commemorating Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening, sitting in that awakening. It's right here, right now. When I turn to today's date, 12-2-21, it jumped out as a palindrome, a pattern read the same front to back or back to front. Today begins a series of nine palindrome dates in this last month of the year. 2021 began with a series of 10, just as we were entering into our encounter of the heart retreat last January. So a kind of frame around this year a year of global upheaval and uncertainty, a cautious reopening, a quiet joy, constant change and shared practice. Today's date gets special billing as it's also an eight digit palindrome. So one, two, oh, two, two, oh, two, one. That fun fact led me to go searching online. Here's one description. Palindromes are words and phrases, words, phrases, and number sequences that have the same spelling backward. Words such as level, kayak, civic, radar, and solos are examples of palindromes. Somehow these words all resonate with what it is we're doing here. The great leveling of the Dharma, this complete equality, this shared journey down what is sometimes called the precipitous strait. Picture the kayak and its freedom to just roll. A radar of the sense gates tuning to things just as they are. Practice that is solo, your own path, commitment and discovery 
and at the same time, collective. Support all around. The whole world sitting you. Front to back, back to front, either enter either direction, either gate. Calls to mind Bodhidharma's practice and principle, or Dogen's practice awakening, or Hui Neng's two track cart that Henry has drawn on and deeply developed so creatively in original love, gradual and sudden. Enter either way. Zen is shot through with these living palindromes, two in one, one in two. Giving, receiving, life, death, wisdom, compassion, We write these couplets with hyphens, but really there's no space for a line, no conjunction, no gap. From any direction, one reality. Every time I've heard our abbot of Sambo Zen give a Taisho or Dharma talk, at some point he says, this is about you, your whole body. Tonight, as a way of looking into the reality that we're immersed in, even as we seek, I'd like to turn to a koan from the Book of Equanimity. This case seems timely as the pandemic continues with the Omicron variant and surely more to come. It surfaced and been a fresh way for me in the wake of Maura Noon's beautiful queer talk a few weeks ago. If you didn't hear it on that Thursday night, be on the watch. It will be posted soon. So this tonight is Case 83 from the Shoyoroku or Book of Equanimity. Here's the case. It's called Dogo's Nursing the Ill. Isan asked Dogo, where have you come from? Dogo said, I come from nursing the ill. Isan said, how many people are ill? Dogo said, there are people who are ill and there are people who aren't ill. Isan said, the one who is not ill, isn't that you, dear Chi? Dogo said, ill or not ill, it has nothing to do with that matter. Say it quickly, say it quickly. Isan said, even if I may say it, there's no relation at all. End of case. So first, a word about these two ancestors, both deeply awake, 
exuding great freedom. Isan or Wishan, Wishan Lingyu, there are two Isans in the tradition. This is um, sort of eighth to ninth century. He was co-founder of the Ego School and a you know, renowned master of a large assembly. And then Dogo, Dao Wangji, I hope I'm saying that sort of correctly. About the same time, in terms of dates, Dogo died a bit earlier. And he was in the Soto lineage, also became a great master. So Isan and Dogo were both disciples of Hyakujo. So they know each other well. Dogo went on to inherit the Dharma from Yakusan, another great master. Dogo shows up in several other koans, quite compelling, with his close Dharma brother, Ungan. Can't help mentioning this because it resonates with this case. They have that, maybe one of the deepest questions, this exchange around what does the bodhisattva of great compassion do with all those hands and eyes? Again, yeah. that's about you. That great compassion pervades this Dharma exchange with Isan. Just shining, kind of line to line. So let's look at it. The case opens with that famous checking question. Where have you come from? Isan asks. It's a koan in itself. Where have you come from? Not different from the question, where are you? Where have you come from? Most of the time, monks answer in an ordinary way. From Santa Fe, from Dallas, from the monastery a few mountains away. That can be a very telling answer. Dogo cuts right to the chase. I come from nursing the ill. That's the life work of practice awakening. Not just what it does, what it is, I come from nursing the ill. The instruction to this case, which was added by Master Bancho, begins with a line about Vimalakirti, this celebrated lay disciple of the Buddha, known for the depth of his awakening. Bancho writes this line, the whole body is ill. Vimalakirti can hardly be healed. The whole body is ill. Vimalakirti can hardly be healed. This is the heart, the core, the jumping off point of the Vimalakirti Sutra. I know it's, we've talked about it often here. It's such a wonderful, vivid story, really, about what it is to be a bodhisattva, 
a being whose very being is about the awakening of all, all beings. In the sutra, the Malakirti is sick. After this wonderful, expansive gathering of the ins and outs of it in the boundless space of Vimalakirti's 10 by 10 doksa, that is just, has no border, like the Zendo. Manchusri, this bodhisattva of great wisdom, asks after Vimalakirti's health. What ails you? I am sick because the whole world is sick. The sutra goes on. Bhimala Kirti says, bodhisattvas come into this world of birth and death for the sake of all beings. And part of being in this world of birth and death is getting sick. When everyone is liberated from illness, I will be too. The whole world. We do get sick. But what is this illness? that the whole body suffers. This tradition that just feeds us endlessly with its richness, with its riches, its wealth, the ancestors' the teachings has a lot to say about this illness. In a word, separation. Projecting distance where there is none. Carving out that gap, that chasm. The difference between you and me. say it in a million ways, but that really says it. We carve this, we cut like a finger in the sand or a knife through the air. When this one entirety, what Dogen calls the true human body, cannot be divided. We know this in our gut. My well-being depends on the well-being of all. Vimala Kirti and Dogo invite us to realize, realize, realize the unconditional wholeness. Not to edge toward it by logic, but to take the leap, or let go and fall, fall into the vast empty firmament where there is nothing but this one whole body, whole and well, no matter the illness. Dogo says, I come from nursing the ill. Here's where I'm from. Here's how I'm coming. Isan asks, how many people are ill? 
a sparring question, also showing what he's asking. How many people are ill? What number do you put there? Dogo says, there are people who are ill and there are people who aren't ill. Some are awake, some are not. Just one number, awake or not, one fabric, one suffering compassion. I mentioned Morris talk as a beacon shining in the direction of this koan. She spoke openly about being in what the medical profession calls end of life care. And she showed, really shown with the freedom of one body, this fallible body beyond ill or not ill. Freedom from suffering, as she put it, that goes straight to the heart of suffering. Freedom and compassion, our birthright, if you can speak of birth. Fully here, untrammeled. We're delighted in that world. That word is just you know, unpacking it, this unimpeded, not contingent on circumstances including the mortal, ever-present circumstances of illness, aging, if we're lucky, and death. Morris talk sort of graft onto this exchange between Isan and Dogo. reminded me of a book I read a few years ago. It's by the author and naturalist, Elizabeth Tova Bailey. As a young woman, Bailey was suddenly stricken with a nearly totally incapacitating illness. The deepest fabric of her body, the mitochondria were all altered as this unfolded. Anatomy says, mitochondria produce the energy currency of a cell. No currency, no system functioning as intended. Bailey spent one year of her illness really Turning over was something that took the better part of a day's energy. And one year of that illness, she's in the company of a wild snail, brought to her from the surrounding woods by a friend who placed it on the lone plant in her sick room, her recovery room. Her 10 by 10 room. <laughs> this little violet by her bed. So friend brings in a snail and just puts it there. The book is The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. The title alone. draws us in, attunes us to a taste of the world that opened up for Bailey as her known world shrunk to almost nothing. Or maybe 
you know, I've been really Each chapter of this book begins with a superscript, a kind of portal into Bailey's spare writing, the distilled quality of her experience. Some chapters begin with a haiku. It turns out that the Zen master and poet, Isa, Kobayashi Isa, wrote a series of haiku about a snail. I've talked about Isa before, and I know Henry has too. His life is like a canvas of suffering and loss. Death of his mother when he's two, abused by a stepmother, his father later dying of typhoid, he finally married at 51, happy marriage, but three children dying in infancy. And then a fourth when his wife died in childbirth. Then an unsuccessful second marriage, then his house burned to the ground. Then a third marriage with the birth of a daughter who lived. But Issa died before she was born. His most famous poem, this short three lines, is thought to have been written after the death of his third child. This world of dew is a world of dew. And yet, and yet. Ill or not ill. Here are a few of Issa's snail poems that come at the head of the chapters in Bailey's book. At my feet, when did you get here, snail? Sleeping and rising, always with your shell, O oh snail. This spare simplicity, this naked wonder <laughs> from an animal that's housed. Housed and always at home. Little snail facing this way, where to now? Where have you come from? Climb Mount Fuji, O oh snail, but slowly, slowly. Between the haiku, Bailey has a superscription from Edward Wilson's textbook study, Biophilia. He writes, as the exploration is pressed, it will engage more of the things close to the human heart and spirit. The exploration sounds like this practice. Engaging closer to the human heart and spirit. That chapter begins 
with this description from Bailey. She writes, when I woke during the night, I would listen intently. Sometimes the silence was complete, but at other times I could hear the comforting sound of the snail's minuscule munching. She could hear it eating. Very small snail. Ill or not ill. Isan says, the one who is not ill, isn't that you, dear Chi? He's addressing Dogo by his familiar name, Dogo Inchi, Chi. They're engaging in a Dharma duel on our behalf, for our sake. So alive. Togo says, ill or not ill, it has nothing to do with that matter. Say it quickly, say it quickly. This is the question for us. What is that matter? What is the reality that cuts through any concept, any configuration, any trace of separation? Ill, not ill, self, other, awake, unawake. What is the fact that cuts the two into one? This fact, now. Isan and Dogen, Dogo are not just talking about that matter. They're not just talking about it. They're showing it, showing themselves to the full. There's a comment by Mumon in the Mumon Khan where he describes the master just unzipping himself and, you know, Spilling out his guts. Say it quickly, say it quickly. The minuscule munching of a wild snail in the night. Or the thunderous silence of Vimalakirti sitting. A silence heard round the world. that one entirety, swallowing everything. And yet, here we are. Isan has the final move. Even if I may say it, there is no relation at all. Words cannot convey, concepts can't touch it. Yet, there he is, presenting the world of no illness. Even if I may say it, there's no relation at all.
later, Esther Wanshi compiling the koans, this collection, adds the comment, say something anyway. Words can't convey this uh, boundless, indivisible body. Say something anyway. It's a great help and a great comfort. Last night, my partner, Scott, told me about a childhood friend who broke her leg and is struggling. It's not healing as it should. She posted a blurb from Good People News that was an interview with Margaret Mead. An old interview. Here's that blurb. Years ago, anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected me to talk about push fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones. But no, Mead said that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur, a thigh bone that had been broken and then healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger get to the river for a drink or hunt for food, you are meat for prowling beasts. No animal survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur, he goes on, that has healed is evidence that someone has taken time to stay with the one who fell, has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts, Meade said. We are at our best when we serve others. Bodhisattvas. Isan and Dogo are at large in the wide, wide world. Calling us home to civilization of another order. Right here, now, right now. No one ill, and yet, and so, how can we help? Thank you for listening and thank you so much for this shared practice.